Welcome to the Executive Lounge, your business thought leadership program that brings you insights from the lives of men and women who are scaling the daunting heights of either starting their own businesses, growing institutions, both here at home and around the world. My guest today is a woman who, yeah, up until recently, was a part-time author um, and a full-time HR manager with Newmont, Ghana. Uh, recently quit her job to concentrate on writing. Poitua Glover, author of four books and counting. Welcome to the Executive Lounge. <laughs> Thank you so much. So Yashira. who does that? You quit your <laughs> job and then you now want to write full time. Uh, I know. It's like I still shake when I think about it. Um, so to be honest, 2018 has just been a very interesting year. It's just been a series of personal and professional situations. So it wasn't like planned. There was just one situation. It was like each month there was something happening in my life. And it was just one situation sometime in April that just sort of made me pause and rethink what am I doing? What do I want to do? Is this where I want to be? It's like there's a gnawing at you, something nagging within you that you're enjoying this, but there's something that you've left behind. So I, the way that I used to talk about it was like the writing was my side chick. And I had a main wife, and mm. now I need to promote the side chick to the main mm. table. It was just, it was a lot of thinking, but eventually I'm like, let me try this. I think yeah. I'm blessed such that I can actually take time off, so let Let's learn a little bit more about you as a person. I mean, uh, who wants to write? I mean, where do you get the bug? And, and at what point in your life did you think that, hmm, uh, instead of being an astronaut, my passion really lies <laughs> in writing? Uh, so it's difficult to say exactly whether it was just, would, I would have done it any, anyway, but my dad was a writer. So he was a poet, he wrote all kinds of different things. I think I got it from there, but it's also something I've always wanted to do. From the minute I learned my ABCs, I was writing from age six on wow. any piece of paper. And I actually brought one to show to you because I somehow just found it. <laughs> and I wrote this when I was seven years old. You wrote this at I age seven. I wrote this at age seven. It's one of those so um, hand computer, computer paper. So computer my paper. granddad produced computer paper. Wow. Get a company. So imagine you love writing. And you have endless sheets to write on. I would write on a whole ream. I just laid out stuff from the beginning. So this is towards the end. So oh, if you unroll wow. it, then you get to the, the beginning of the story. And I just found this a few weeks ago. You know, we're cleaning the house. Okay, so here's the thing. Any one of you who have not read a book written by Wachua Glover, you'd <laughs> want to because the first time I came across you and your work was uh, when you were launching The Justice. Yes. And I had a chance of reading a copy. It was the first time I read a book that I literally couldn't put down until I was done. And I was oh, disappointed when you. it was done. You know, uh, because I wanted to just keep reading about mm -hmm. these characters. Now, we're going to get into this, but I just want to do something. Um, I'm going to pick a random spot in here. <laughs> and do you know that when I was like six or seven, my influences were English literature, mm. like colonial old school. So you'll see a bit of that in there. But oh. yeah, pick a spot. Imagine this is okay. seven years old. So, so this is you. Kind. So here's what it uh, says. Uh, Martha pouted. Selfish. Mama. Liza is selfish. Tom started crying and Ma Maria started singing and rocking him. He quietened down. Maria turned to Tom. Okay, I'm having difficulty reading your hand. <laughs> I was seven. <laughs> but, I mean, so you found this. Um, yes. and, and it just demonstrates that you didn't come by four books, I would believe, by accident. No. You've honed the skill and the desire and the passion. How do you come by the characters? How do you create them? Yeah. Um, so the characterization, to be quite honest, it's two fundamental principles for me. Characters that people can relate to on some level. You can have a reaction to. So connection and realism. It doesn't mean you like the character, but you need to have a reaction to the character. So if I think about Caleb, and I think yeah, there's Caleb mania yeah. everywhere. Caleb from The Justice. There's something about him that may not be like regular folk, but people connect to it. So there's something really dangerous, and, 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 but still you feel like you could know such a person. So it is deliberate when I create characters that I want characters that solicit something from people, mm. whatever that may be. Right. Now, you then have a character. What comes first, the plot, the story, yeah. or the character? 
the idea. You need to start from What's the fundamental the idea. idea. Okay. So with the justice, for instance, the, the very, the tiny piece, the seed of the idea would be, okay, I want to do something around politics. And they start to think, okay, so if it's around politics, what could the story be like? So you shape it from just one little premise or genre or just a tiny idea, and then you figure out how to grow it. Is it going to be someone who's in power, trying to get into power? Which angle do you want to go with? And then you think through, who do you want to center the story on? Who's the character? But it starts with the idea, you broaden where you want things to be, then you start to fill in the character, start to fill in the pieces. And then you think through, there has to be a journey. So for me, when it comes to writing, I'm not just writing. There's the beginning, the middle, the end. So you think through, what do I want this journey to be like? What sort of emotional roller coaster do I want it to be? And mm. then you get to the conclusion. So the way I did my very first book, so the first few books, was more of a stream of thoughts and ideas that somehow I shaped into a book. Mm -hmm. The justice was very different. The justice, I was extremely deliberate. I planned it. I created a blueprint. So I had the idea, the characters, the, the chapters, everything mapped out before I even sat behind the computer. Wow. Obviously, as I was writing, I changed things, but I shaped the whole thing. So it wasn't just, it was just sitting down and, oh, okay. No. I planned it out, I thought through it, and I wrote it that way. They talk about writer's block and all of those mm -hmm. things. We'll get to that in a moment. But, um, I mean, accomplishment of four books, that's, that's no mean feat. Um, combining so it's three that with published. Three published, yes. yes. The okay. fourth one on the its way. fourth on its way. So um, you did all these while either going through school and yep. also working full time. How is that possible? That is extremely difficult, Ishara. That's like, it's been so painful. When I did the, the first book, my first complete book, I was actually at Wesley Girls High School. Um, so, well, the one was Richard, I was 13, but the first full one, basic reality, I think most of the gay girls would remember that. You're in the middle of school trying to write. Then my next one, I was doing a full-time job. So I've never actually written a whole book with nothing going on. And that's always been my thought or my dream. Imagine if you could just escape somewhere and all you're doing is writing. So the way that I handled things, and that's because I'm a bit of a control freak, I'm very anal, very mm -hmm. planful, I have mm -hmm. to-do list and everything, is that I decided to carve time out of each day. So I set a target. It's just like the way you work, and that's the benefit I think I've gained from being in the corporate world. So I set a target of every single Sunday, I'm going to have 20 pages done, or one chapter. And that's how you focus. If not, and you're just going to sit and, and say, whenever I feel like writing, I'll write, You'll never get anything done. So when I really wanted to write, I created the targets, I created deadlines, and then I had people waiting for each chapter. So you have someone who's expecting a deliverable. It's almost like you're working. Mm. So every Sunday, there were three or four people that I would email a chapter to. So it's like a series for them. So because they're dependent on it, you've given yourself the targets. It, it was forcing me to continue writing. So, so that's you how have I've people done it so who far. would have read chapter by chapter of, three books. of the justice. Yes. And what did they tell you when you said, this is the last chapter? They were disappointed too. <laughs> but they wanted to see the full thing because they get it just chapter. But imagine getting the full complete book. Mm. So to them, it's like you're watching a telenovela. So every Sunday, you're going to get there's an, an email. There's a new episode there's coming. There's a new episode coming. By the time it got to the end, they're like, wow, it would be great to see this all together. Do you think that when you write, you are able to imagine what the impact of the writing will be on your readers? Yes. You do? You have to. You, you're not. But the one thing, though, is I'm not trying to force a particular experience or impact. I just know there are some basic things I want people to react to. First and foremost, I want it to be easy. One of the things I struggled with with some of the books that I used to read was, it's like you're reading text. You're reading something so heavy. And everybody tries to make it so deep and uh, try and create some philosophical enlightenment. I didn't want that. I didn't want my books to feel like work. So the main reaction I, I hope readers get is the entertainment. Mm. The, the easiness of reading it, to get something just really cool out of it without necessarily forcing you into changing who you are and how you think. I just want you to have fun. Mm. So that's my basic premise. If okay. people get more than that out of it, fantastic. Mm. But have fun, enjoy it. That's why I write. All right, so now let's start peeling this complex onion called Bwachua Glover. Okay. Um, we've done Writing 101. We'll come back to that in a moment. But growing up, what was it like? What's, what's family like? 
family is everything. To me, family is like number one. I think I have it on my website, my blog. Family centers me. Um, growing up, I, I think my background was just really diverse in how we were. It was a big family, grew up with my grandparents, my mother, my brothers, cousins. I was always surrounded by family. There wasn't a time when you just feel like it's such a small nuclear piece. Mm. You know, cousins, relatives, going to the same school, spending time together, it's the same right now. My closest friends are my family. So my background was family and family support. I will not be anywhere without that type of support I had. I mean, you were MC for the Justice Book launch. It's like the room was full of family. Mm. Yeah, so growing up, I went to pretty good schools. Rich Edge was fantastic, then Wesley Girls, then University of Ghana, then New York University. And it's all through the commitment and support of family. My family's like everything. Wow. And um, obviously your father was a writer. Um, was there any other literary um, forebear in the family apart from your father? No, not exactly. But you don't always, the influences don't always have to be literary. Like my mother is a, a business consultant, but she's also a feminist. Like everybody fire and white in the family knows, oh, okay, Auntie Abobia would cream me if I say this about women. She's like a very staunch, very strong female figure and really believes in giving uh, people a chance to do what they want to do. Mm -hmm. So as much as I got the talent from my father in terms of the literary piece, I got the focus, the commitment, and the drive also from my mother, and that all counts. Mm. Um, so those influences, and my grandfather was a military person, um, very strong and prominent military person in Ghana, so he also has this drive of you don't give up, uh, so the discipline around that also helped me with my writing. And he'd be giving me the papers. Mm. I mean, he'd scream at me when the papers are lying over the place. But I think all of those figures in my life really helped me. My brothers, everybody reading the books, giving feedback. It's been fantastic. Like, from so a at the moment, it, it's easy to say that you're the sum total of the family experiences and the support that you've had. That's an interesting way to put it. I think I haven't thought about it like that, but possibly. I think so. Actually, sure, I think I'm having a bit of an epiphany right now. <laughs> <laughs> Just based on what you said, because my granddad being a military person, I'm a very detailed, like I can't begin to describe to you how detailed and planful. I have a, a to-do list for today, and number one, this, ensure I interview. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I come from that background, but you're right. I think the military piece, the writing from my dad, the focus from my mom, all of that probably has shaped me. And the entertainment from uh, the cacophonous yes. cousins. Cousins and brothers. But, yeah, you know, back then, me and my brothers and cousins would go to uh, a video store to get a VHS, mm -hmm. all of that. Yeah, you're right. Wow, interesting huh. stuff. So, uh, moving on swiftly, um, you know, writing is interesting. I'm sure lots of people feel that they have something in them and mm -hmm. or, or the expression of a talent is something that when it flourishes makes everyone happy. But how do you take a talent that comes to you innately and then you make it yeah. like, into a book yeah. and now a career? Because yeah. you talked about some technical stuff, and, yeah. and uh, did you go to writing school at some yeah. point? It's a really good question. I think a couple of fundamentals for me. One is I think writing comes from experimentation and practice. And the mistake I used to make was thinking there would be a perfect moment and perfect time to do certain things. So for anybody who feels like they have something in them, the number one thing I will say is just do it. Mm. Just start to write, just start to put things on paper. By the time I got to the first published book, I had done things like this, right? I'd done some of those smaller things on pieces of paper before you can get to your first one. So don't wait to feel like you have a full book in you mm. before you write. Just start with anything, any, just pen, paper, put thoughts together, call it a blog, call it an article, a piece, start from there, and then learn. I bought books. I didn't go to any formal writing program, but I bought books from when I was in the US, Barnes & Noble, How to Write, Writing Techniques, but the second fundamental principle, so the first one I would say is just do it, just begin it. The second one is know you. So when I was reading some of those books, they, the books were guiding you towards this stream, this flow, go with the flow. But that's not me. So it's creating a bit of dissonance. I am planful. And then most people make it seem like when you're a writer, you just need to go with it and not be that planful. But it wasn't working for me. And I think it led to a better product with justice when I became, I took control over the process. Mm. 
and I mapped it out and I was very diligent and very planful and very prescriptive as to how I wanted the book to go. So the second piece is read and learn, but figure out what works best for you in order for you to get a product that you can be proud of. Mm -hmm. The third part, which is the hardest, and I haven't like finished honing in on that, is as much as it's an art, if you want to take it somewhere, you have to make it a business as well. Wow. You have to. And that's the journey that you've decided to go That's the journey that on. I now want to start on. Is but it's a very it. bold uh, risk to take. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, personally, if, if it counts for anything, I think it's a good risk to take, especially with the quality of the writing that I, I, I've uh, come to see in The Justice. So. Uh, don't worry, you'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, uh, but you are, we're going to take a short break in a moment. But before we do that, um, what was the most difficult part of getting the justice done? Oh, Lord. So many. Where do I begin? Finding the time, because I was in an in a organization where this, there was a lot of stress. My work was time-consuming, very stressful, mm. very difficult. I was sleeping at 2 a.m. So by the time I finish my regular job, eat, do anything, it's like 10, and I've set myself a target to write every week. So the long hours was very difficult. But I think the hard parts for writers in Ghana, including myself, is when you're done, you have a finished product. Getting it to the final stage is not easy, Shira. Mm. You've written, it's a labor of love. But you now need to find publishers, you need to find editors, you need to find marketing, the cover. That process can really make you just pack the book. Like when I wrote my very first one, The Basic Reality, a publisher, it was Ghana, I was 21, said he wouldn't publish it because it had one sex scene in it. So just getting someone to believe in the book and want to do something with you is very challenging. And then the marketing, getting the book out there. It's the writing parts you enjoy, you like, the business aspects of the writing, the publishing, the editing, the packaging, the getting out there is the hardest part. Wow. That was the hardest part for for the justice, I would say. Okay. We're going to take a short break now. When we come back, I'm going to get into Bachelor's mind about what she thinks ought to be done to grow the value chain for the literary arts and uh, some more other interesting stuff. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Executive Lounge with me in Shirado and my guest, author Bachelor Glover. Bachelor, just before we took the break, you talked about how you go through the labor of love mm -hmm. and then you finally have a product and then you have to put up with whether you're getting the marketing right or you're getting a publisher who's able to. I mean, do you find that our culture makes it difficult for certain things to happen? Um, you know, for example, the yeah. publisher saying, I'm not publishing this because there's a sex scene in mm -hmm. there. I mean, this is a book, right? Not mm -hmm. a movie. Are we over censoring the things we do? Do we have too many sensibilities? What do you think is missing? I think what is really missing is we just, broadly speaking, we're not a literary um, culture, just broadly speaking. I think we've gotten to a point more recently where our entertainment has to be quick, easy, fast. A lot of people don't have the patience to sit with a good book. Mm. It's YouTube, it's social media, it's a quick song, it's a, a movie. A book takes time. It takes you stepping away from everything you're doing, putting your phone down for a minute. If we had a culture and environment where we were literary inclined, then obviously businesses would be willing to support authors and publish them and market them. Mm -hmm. But what people want is the CDs and the movies. And I mean, look at the movies, we, the Ghanaian movies we churn out. Because it's quick, it's easy. Someone goes and pays 15 CDs, they're done. But you buy a book, it's going to take you a while to read it. And we also want to be visual. So one, we're not very literary. We want quick, easy entertainment. We're mm -hmm. also very visual. You want to see it. We're not imaginative anymore. When you read a book, you have to draw on your own imagination to create the character, to picture the character, and you're on that journey yourself. You're shaping it. Mm -hmm. But we are now a culture where you just want someone to show you, to tell you, to put the picture up there. We're just so visual. So it also makes it challenging. And how to change that is, that's why I like uh, uh, folks like Mon who are like doing the spelling bee and trying to create a reading culture. Mm -hmm. And the reading culture comes from imagination and creativity. If we can create that, publishers or companies will find that there's a market and go to that market. Our comp I don't blame the publishers or companies out there because you want to go where there's money. You want to go to what people want when it comes to the entertainment. Mm -hmm. Currently in Ghana, books are not entertainment. 
when it's entertainment, it's quick, easy, visual. So unless that shifts, writers will always, always have a challenge. Okay, so I'm giving you a job. In Give my, it to me. In my, um, <laughs> uh, you know, this state called Ghana um, that I run. And I'm giving you a job to show me how we can turn this around. Because, I mean, a reading nation is a nation that's going somewhere. Yes. Uh, and we certainly want to go somewhere. So how do we change that narrative? How do we get people reading more? Uh, because the millennial Ghana that you've described is one that is totally different from the Ghana that I grew up yes. in. Yes. And yes. you too. Yeah. So how do we go back to that good time? I would say two things. One, we also can't be stuck in the past. So even for me as a writer, I know that, okay, if you're trying to tell a story, there are different ways to do that. So you also need to adapt to the times. Okay. The younger generation that's coming, you can't force them all in one direction of just reading books. You also have to understand what they want and try and adapt to that. So the first thing is for people like us who are writers, who are literary, who read, need to figure out how to tap into that audience without forcing them to lose where they are, where they're going. We are a digital world. Mm -hmm. So if it's a matter of creating a blog, it's a matter of creating a website, it's a matter of packaging, you're writing a different way. Like someone came to me about doing comic strips and things like that. You have to be flexible. So one, the, the creatives, we need to be flexible. But the second piece, which goes to, since you're running the state, is education. Mm. You know, we have to start from there. As much as we're becoming a very fast-paced world, it doesn't mean you can't infuse more time for kids to read. I was having a chat with someone. I was talking about, I'm doing up a room for my nephew. And she's like, put writing stuff there. Mm -hmm. Put posters. There are ways to influence and draw children into reading. Mm -hmm. You know, but we're not spending a lot of time doing that. So if I had the opportunity to, if I could talk to people, is you need to infuse that into our education. It's not just the football summer games. I mean, on radio, I'm hearing, oh, this summer camp for football is open. There's no summer camp for reading. There's no summer camp for writing. But we can start to do more of those things. And it starts from education. Let's not worry too much about those who are in their 20s, 30s right now. Let's know that it's a very long journey and start from those who are in school. That's where we need to go to. Wow, that's interesting. Looks like uh, I have... Am a, I hired? No, you're hired, you're hired, you're hired. You're, hired. you're uh, the Minister of Education. Thank you, in my, my dream job. hypothetical uh, <laughs> country, if I ever get there. Mm -hmm. But on a more serious note, Pacho, I like the idea of talking education. I'm very passionate about education. And it's largely because of the exposure to reading. Uh, as a child, I discovered the Accra Library um, on the high street mm -hmm. uh, where I would go and immerse yeah, myself me in books. You used to go there Same too. one. All right. Uh, and then, you know, there was a, there, there was a, a, a link between the children's side and yes. the adult side. Yep, so yep. after a while, you get bored with reading the children's books. You go to the other you side. Go to the other <laughs> side, exactly. You know, but today, you know, let me pause for a moment. I had a chat with a friend um, a few days ago. I was writing an email and I had strung a, a sentence together. And sometimes you put stuff together and you're like, ah, did I actually write this well? Mm -hmm. Because I wasn't, it was in my subconscious. And he said that, you see, the thing about education is that it opens you up to lots of things. Yes. And sometimes when you're reproducing these things, you don't even realize that it was yes. there in the first place. Yes. Have we departed from education and rather school people today? Yes. We totally have. For me, the, the premise, especially, I'm just touch on tertiary. Mm -hmm. Because when I went to Lagos and I went to NYU, there's a fundamental difference. Wow. When you're going to school, school is supposed to open up your mind to think. It's not meant to just tell you what to do. And that comes from the reading and the exposure. It's to give you a perspective. Mm -hmm. So it's to force the thinking for yourself. But here, you, you go and sit in a class of 900 people. The professor will just read whatever they want to read. You take the notes, that's it. There isn't a question that is thrown up there for you to debate and challenge and discuss and pull on your perspectives. So in what you described, when, you've, when you are well read and you, you, you are able to think that way, you pull from those experiences without even realizing it. But if not, you're waiting to be told. You're waiting to be directed. You're waiting for someone to put you in a certain path. And that's the thing, that's part of the problem with our education. It's the telling versus their experience 
and the logic and the thinking. Mm. We, we are cr shaping people to be the same way, and we're not even allowing room for debate and discussion. Like even the way exams are conducted right now, mm -hmm. it's multiple choice. We should scrap multiple choice. You put an essay, have someone write, have someone work out a problem, have someone think, have someone read and go and do a summary. But when you do that, it creates work for the educators. And we just want, we're, we're not just in a place where we want things to be very quick, very easy, very fast. We're losing our patience with the journey and how long some things take to get to a certain point. But you're so right on that. And the reading, the piece I want to talk about, the Ghana Library Board, is guess what? Our parents took us there. Yeah. So we need more of those avenues, and we need more parents to take kids to those places. I loved it. It didn't feel like work. Mm -hmm. It didn't feel like it was something difficult. I loved going to the library. But well, how it many libraries fun. do we have? Uh, the Ghana Library Board. I don't even know if it's still open. I don't know. Okay, well, we're going to have to take a trip <laughs> and, and revisit that uh, building. But, you know, it's very profound what you said. Uh, and for me, the profundity is in the fact that you're able to identify the fundamental differences in how we're taught here yeah. and how we're taught elsewhere. Yeah. Um, the way if we want to change tomorrow, we have to start with the ones who will be running yes. tomorrow, which yes. is the younger people. Now, we have abundant media. We do. Um, for a small country, we have more than 300 radio stations. Is it? Uh, yes. Wow. Okay. Um, and we also have quite a lot of television channels. Um, and when the digital switchover is complete, we'll even have more because you wow. now have uh, multiplex, uh, multi, multiplexes where more channels can be put on narrow pipes. Um, but we seem to be taking in more. Now, yeah. again, back to our hypothetical state. How do we fix the value chain, the knowledge value chain? Does the media hold a key to it? Yes. And if it does, how do you think it should be done? The media shapes what is consumed, totally. But the media is also catering to what they feel like people want. So with all of these radio channels, if you tune to whichever one, the conversation is the same. Mm. And that's because they feel like that's what people want to hear. What the media can do, if the media took it upon themselves, is to also force a certain thinking and narrative of reading, of thinking outside the box, of innovation, of creativity. But again, it's like they would feel like, I am not going to be making as much as the next person who's talking all the politics and talking this and that. It's we need more risk takers in the media. We need more people to push against the envelope and almost start some type of revolution of reading and thinking. Mm. Not just the reading. To me, the thinking part is very, very important. Because someone can read and they can't tell you anything. Mm. Like even in the workplace, you ask someone for information, they'll send you a whole 20-page report. In a thinking environment, they will summarize that for you. They will answer your question by, they've read the report, okay, this is what she's asking for, blah, 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 they summarize. We don't do that anymore. Yeah. So I always put the reading and the thinking together. And the media can push that if they're willing to be risk takers. Definitely means you're going against the grain. You may lose out on some profit or income. But if you want to shape a nation of thinkers, the media can be out there in the schools. Um, a friend of mine was talking about doing like reading um, seminars at whether it's a share the University of Ghana. The media can latch onto that on a really big scale help kids read and create programs or channels where you're, you're reading, you're thinking, you're debating, you're questioning. You are just being yourself, you're bringing your perspectives. That would be fantastic if people would be willing to go against the grain. And that's what it would be. It's not going to be something easy. You're going to go against the grain if you go that route. Okay. But it would be fulfilling. I'm sure it will be. Uh, Nation of Thinkers. Yes. Uh, it will be certainly a good one to live in. Exactly. Let's look at the parallels um so a writing career here in ghana mm -hmm. a writing career somewhere else across the atlantic mm -hmm. in terms of the value chain so the people who make a living as agents yeah the people who make a living as editors yeah people who make a living as ghostwriters they make a living as 
publishers. I mean, it's a very rich value chain. Yeah. Very limited here. Yeah. How do we change what we have? What is it they're doing differently that has created all these jobs for people to fill in? It's the market. So there, people are writing, people are producing what I would say content. So then you can have enough agents because they're getting 300, 400 thousands of manuscripts sub uh, submitted. And if you're able to get your manuscript to the right publisher or editor who wants to take a chance on you, you can become someone big. But here, the market isn't necessarily there. What I have done, though, it's one of the, the business models I'm looking at. So it's not just full-time writing. I registered a company about five years ago called Minds on Fire. Uh, so the website is mindsonfiregroup.com. And it has sort of like three arms. There's the publishing arm. And what I want to do is people bring me sub, uh, uh, submissions. And I want to make that serious and big and really publicize that. If you have a book, come. We'll help you think through it, write it, edit it, shape it, and try and get it out there. Mm. Because writers need help. That's number one. You just don't sit in a corner and write. You need that next step to happen for you if you want to get your words out there. So I think it's for more, again, I call it risk taking. People like me and others being willing to set up small businesses to do that and help these writers. Because the other problem too with writing in Ghana is the language and the content isn't there. There's a bit of a quality gap and we need to work on that. So isn't that a case of not being able to give what you don't have? That's it. <laughs> Probably. Okay. It just comes from the education. Right. So if, if, if we had the right quality education, we would have the right content being produced. Because even our newspapers, you read it and you're like, dear God, like, didn't someone edit this? Didn't someone go through this? It's the quickness. We're such a quick, 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 quick nation. And that's, you know, derailing our ability to really take time, write solid, deep, profound content, edit properly, and have the patience to go through the process. And that's what I really want to do with the business is for those who feel like they can write is to help them understand that it takes growth and experience and maturity. Don't just churn it out. Even if in writing, you can get anybody to print a book for you. Mm -hmm. But don't go that route. Don't just write it, put it together, print it, and you feel like you're done. Have a sense of standard mm -hmm. that you want to put something out there that's high quality and, and educate yourself and learn in order to get there. So we, our market will be very different unless we have people who are willing to take some of those chances and set themselves up as publishers and agents and the like. The market in the U.S. exists the way it is because you've got the people that want to do that. And to be quite honest, one of the reasons I'm taking time off is I want to see if I can try that. I want to see if I can actually get a book agent, get a book deal, get a bigger market, get bigger access, and use that to do something. Because trust me, anybody can get published. Mm. But it says a whole lot more if you get published the right way. Okay. It gives it a certain credibility, and that's what I want to try. That's a good goal to have. So, um, writer's block. How often did you get some, and uh, how did you get over it? I don't know if there's a particular recipe to get over it, but I, I have... <laughs> I, I think I, I, my fourth book I mentioned, I work on the fourth book. Mm -hmm. The first one, which was published, Circles, and then five years later, I published the next two. Mm -hmm. Now it's been another five years. That's it was right. 2013 we did wow, the yeah, launch. Wow, yeah, that's true. That's five years. So I've been working on the fourth book, and I don't know if it's because of writer's block or just time. It hasn't been flowing or being shaped the way that I would like. Mm -hmm. um, the recipe I'm going to try, and we'll see how it works, because it's the first time I'm experiencing writer's block in a certain way, is to just take the time off. Like, you know, just try and, uh, a friend has offered, oh, I have a beach house or pram pram or this or that, like just go, clear the noise, just have everything subside and see if it will flow again. So I don't have like a magic wand as to how most people handle writer's block. Mm -hmm. I am just trying to reduce the distractions, the noise, uh, the pool, and then just try and refocus and see if that would work. Your Biggest pull up until a month ago was work. Biggest, yes. Right. Um, apart from work, would you say there were other pulls that you needed to deal with? I mean, we yes. all are yes. happy today, maybe tomorrow not so happy. Yes. Someone upsets us. How do you deal with those ones? That's a very interesting question. So besides work, yes, I think this year has been a very dramatic year for me from a family perspective. Um, in December, my mom and I got robbed in a hotel. We're actually gassed and robbed. 
And then after that was just a whole series of things happening from a family perspective, lost Sorry a cousin. About that. Yes, I, I lost a cousin recently, um, helping to take care of her child. So it's just a lot happening. But one thing that has helped me and, um, is actually God, finding my proper way back to God. Mm. The way I say proper ways, a lot of people would call themselves Christians, but are we really seeking God? Or is it just a title or a status you give to yourself, but you don't really live that life? So in the noise, it's unfortunate that most of us tend to God when there's that chaos and noise and you feel like you're flailing. It's unfortunate that's when that drives us. You know, I wish we would go to God even when there's peace and stability and we feel like we're okay. But I went back to that and that's what's helping me to feel centered. Like I'm having issues with a house I'm building and someone mentioned something like, oh, it's going to be okay. Because for me right now in my life, and this is more the last two months, God is giving me a certain center. And I was listening to a Joel Austin podcast recently where he said, you know, people, we're in a we're proving world. You always want to prove something, but you don't need to prove anything if you remember that fundamentally your value comes from being a child of God. Mm. So when I start from that basic premise, it does not matter what, ha what happens during this break that I'm trying to take. It doesn't matter. It means you should still try and achieve, but realize that just being a child of God, that's enough. Have it. That's where your value is. Wow. Everything else you're doing is the extras. So the distractions, the noise, what I am doing right now is really centering myself on the word, on God, on my relationship with God in a true way and not in a superficial way at no. all. Wonderful. We're going to take our final break, and uh, when we come back, we're going to learn a little more from Boatia Glover. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the Executive Lounge with me and Shira Addo and my guest, Boatia Glover, full time author and uh, literary entrepreneur. Boatia, it's intriguing, you know, how you decided that you're going to walk away from a Pretty good job. Pretty good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Someone's dream job. Mm -hmm. you know? um, and then focus on writing, especially coming from a space and in a country where writers don't really make a lot of money. Yeah. You know, how many times have you had doubt yeah. since you left the job? I, I love your question. I totally do. I remember attending a bar camp. Um, mentoring events last year and then I was there as a corporate person and there were all of these sort of like entrepreneurs following their dreams and passions and I was very passionate about you can still work like you can be a corporate person and people were curious about that then fast forward a year I am going down the same path as these others mm -hmm. but one thing that I will never knock down is what I have gained working in a corporate world like it's given you, given me skills that are beneficial. So mm -hmm. people who are creators should never feel like working for someone is such a bad thing that you need to leave at all costs. Because mm -hmm. I've learned skills such as managing finances, influencing people, working to deadlines and deliverables. It creates a certain skill set which is fundamental if you want to go beyond your creatives. But yes, at this point that I've made a decision, it, it's quite scary, very scary, because I'm leaving a very good paycheck. Mm. I think when the final paycheck came, I was like, am I really walking away from this? <laughs> but I also want to give myself a chance in mm. Shira. That's the fundamental thing for me, is I want to give myself a chance. I don't want to be 60 plus in a snazzy corporate office, plush office, and wonder what if. Like, what if you took the time? Mm. Could you have been like a Chimamanda? Could you have been like this or that? Because when I go to bed, my dream is not dreaming to be CEO. What keeps me, what is in my tummy, what gnaws at me is, I want to be out there. I want to be a known writer. I want to be a best-selling writer. And if I'm in 60, 70, and I feel like I didn't give myself a chance to do that, it will haunt me. It doesn't matter how much money I'm making. It doesn't matter what my title is that is a much more powerful thing in me than just continuing earning the paycheck. And then the fortunate thing is I am blessed that at this moment, because a lot of people don't get that, I can actually take the time off. So I'm taking 18 months off. I can actually take 18 months off and not work. And if you realize that and you have the opportunity and ability to do so, why not? It doesn't mean that at the end of the 18 months, I might not go back and find a full-time job. But then I would always know I tried. 
And if I don't try, I think that's what will eat away at my soul. I may sound dramatic, but I love writing. It is my passion. It is my all. So why not try? Just mm. give yourself time to write. Try and seek a book agent, movie deal, TV deal, whatever it may be. Like just commit that time to it and see what happens. That's all I want to do. Well, I mean, it's a great and interesting adventure to go on. Uh, the fact that we live in a digital world, books are taking on new forms. It's audio books. There's, yeah. um, you know, uh, augmented reality books and all kinds of things. TV. Yeah. The silver screen. I mean, are you thinking along those lines? Which of your books do you think would readily be Come able on. to, to, <laughs> you to and I jump know. <laughs> to jump at the silver screen? Yes, I am totally thinking that. It's like when we had when we talked before. I said we as writers and creatives need to be adaptable and flexible. So I am thinking along the lines of how do people receive their content? Yeah, movie, TV, digital, all of that. I'm exploring. I think the justice. I am putting it out there. I think someone needs to work with me to bring the justice to the screen. It would be, it would be phenomenal. It will be, and yes. uh, and and I think uh, I don't know, but maybe I speak for myself. Um, when you love reading, it it does something to your imagination. Mm -hmm. So there are scenes, you know, that you recreate in your own mind, mm -hmm. and and. I would love to see the Godfather effect that, you know, you kind of, you read the book and saw the movie and even the dialogue in the movie, the little details of uh, Clemenza cooking yep. when they went to the mattresses was replicated in the movies, the description of the cars, mm -hmm. you know, so having to read imagine and then relive that imagination yes. on the screen is, yes. is, is an awesome and, thing. And it has to be done well. And I'm glad you used the Godfather as an example because the way The Godfather was written and the way that was done on screen was, it didn't take away from your imagination. Mm -hmm. It brought it to life in a certain way, but also enabled you to fill in certain gaps. That's the reaction to The Godfather mm -hmm. is, as much as it is visual and it's a movie, they still left room for you to infuse what you got from the book. Mm -hmm. It's a fantastic book movie combo because not all movies get it right. True. So I, I would love to do things like that. I'm not, I'm not moving into this space just to go and write and churn out books. But I keep calling it content. I want to produce content that can for sit audiences. Anywhere. Yes, that can sit anywhere and tells a story, it entertains. Fundamentally, like I said, fundamentally, for my writing, I'm not trying to use it as text. I want to use it to entertain, mm. for someone to enjoy it. So there's different ways to entertain. You seem to have a pretty good life. Um, I mean, you're constantly, you know, doing something with your imagination. Mm -hmm. I mean, what gets you going? What, what, what makes you happy? So on my, I, I like this line because I put it, I think, in one of the books or something that um, I'm a connoisseur of life. I enjoy life. I enjoy being with my family, with people. I appreciate life. And I'm also someone I don't like to put myself in a box. You know, I like to think outside that, have different perspectives, challenge the status quo. So that's what really, that's, that's my, my influences is when someone says A, I'm like, yeah, actually, what if it was B? You know, just thinking in different ways and experiencing things, going to watch a movie, hanging out with friends, also solitude. I think one thing we also miss as a nation, and I'm glad you asked so I can squeeze that in, is self-reflection. It's having enough time to sit by yourself, with yourself, and just think through, what am I doing? Do I have principles that are guiding me in life? What, what do I want to go? What do I want to do? We need self-reflection as much as we need interacting with people. Mm. That's it for me. It's to enjoy life, but also enjoy myself and respect myself and know who I am. Well, guess what? Painfully, that's it for us. I it, know. So <laughs> good to be here, though. Thank it you. It certainly has. I've had a great time talking to you about your Glover and a great deal of lessons from this. I have five takeaways from this conversation. Number one is that your good enough is always going to be good enough. Don't wait to have the full project. Don't wait to have the full deal. Don't wait to have the final product before you go to market. Take what you have and keep going with improvements as you go along. Uh, I think I read somewhere uh, that uh, entrepreneurship is jumping out of a, uh, an airplane without a parachute and building one on your way down. Uh, so whatever it is that you have, start with it. Number two is uh, surround yourself with people who will uh, challenge you, who make you better, who most importantly will love you because out of that love you get from the people around you, you'll have the confidence to explore 
the new things that you want to do, the confidence to just go out there and be who you believe you were made to be. Number three is that you should find a center. Always anchor onto something, a supreme being or as the place, uh, the, have your own little shrine, whatever you want to call it. But make your way to that source of your being, God. Because in there you'll find guidance, you'll find clarity and peace and you need that to progress. Number four is that by all means, harness that talents that you have. They're natural, but they are meaningless unless they bear fruit. And they'll only bear fruit when they become skills. So um, you should take the talent and hone it. You hone it by investing in it, buy the books, read them, go to seminars, listen to other people's thoughts on how what you want to be doing is done, and just literally throw yourself into learning to be the best at the thing that you naturally uh, gifted at. And the final thing I'm taking away from all of this, take chances. Just That's it, just take chances. If you believe in something, take a chance because you will regret not taking the chance compared to learning from failing when you took the chance. Thank you again, Dwecho. Thank you so much. And to you, thank you for watching. We'll be back again with the Executive Land. Until then, I'm in Shirado. Go forward. Make rain. Shalom. <laughs>